So I'll bet that you've never seen before one of the keywords or concepts presented in this Golang video. In this video we will look at 5 not too well known concepts or keywords in Golang and maybe that can improve your Golang code and you might learn a thing or two. Now of course there are always alternatives to these specific discussed keywords or concepts in Golang, but maybe this will improve your Golang code and make it even more readable. Obviously applying these concepts or keywords always depends on a specific use case or problem scenario. So let's just get quickly into the first keyword. Now the first one is pretty straightforward and really easy to understand and maybe you've heard of this keyword before. And it is obviously the IOTA keyword here. Now this specific keyword in Golang is pretty much useful for whenever you want to create some sort of sequence of related constants. So I'll give you first a way how you should not approach this specific problem and then I will give you the correct version. So let's just start with the wrong way of doing things. Let's just say that we want to, for instance, define Monday to Sunday as constants but also declared as integers. Now for that it's pretty straightforward, we'll just create here a const group and then we will pretty much define Monday as one and so on and so forth. Now I think that's pretty clear, right? And it's pretty cool that we can do this in Golang. However, this is somehow a problem, right? Because it's not really beautiful and it is really, really ugly. So let's just say that we've decided to let the Monday start at zero, right? So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So in the end, the Sunday is the six and the Monday is the zero. And obviously this is pretty problematic because I have to pretty much go through this constant list here or constant group and change all the values. And this is where this magic IOTA keyword comes into play. Now this pretty much allows automatic numbering. So for instance, when we define here IOTA, we get Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but we don't need anymore to define the values here for these constants, which is pretty neat, I think. So what we have now is that Monday starts with zero in this case and Sunday ends with six. So let's quickly demonstrate this by just printing out these constants. Okay, I've got here a pretty basic just print line statements. So let's quickly run this function here or run this main function. And what we see is the expected output, right? So this is a pretty common and neat way of doing this kind of stuff. But let's just say that now the use case is that Monday should be one again, right? What could we do about it? Now it's pretty easy because IOTA is in the end also some sort of value. And what we can say is plus one. So that pretty much means that we can use IOTA in an expression as well. And what we get in the end is that Monday starts with one and Sunday ends with seven. Another way of approaching this situation would be to just define an underscore here and then say IOTA and then don't initialize the next value. So what we have is that the underscore pretty much means that we ignore this specific declaration here. And then because IOTA iterates over our constant kind of group, it says that Monday is one, Tuesday is two, and so on and so forth. Now that was a pretty simple example, let's just quickly look at another example which makes things hopefully a bit more clear. Now we can use this IOTA concept also in expressions like I said before. So for instance we can even define so called bit flags. Now what does that mean? Pretty much we can just say here readable for instance. Let's just then define writable and also executable. So these are our like three flags. Right? And what we can now use is IOTA. Now, obviously, readable is now zero, writable is one, and executable is two, but we don't want this, right? We want pretty much to maybe even shift some kind of bit in this IOTA or while applying this IOTA. So, for instance, we can say one here and then a left shift by IOTA. Now, what does this thing actually resolves into? 
So first, I'm not going to explain bit shifting and all that, but what we do is pretty much just shift some bits in this expression. So for instance, IOTA starts with zero, obviously. So in the end, this kind of expression resolves in one left shift by zero. And now because one expressed in bits is, let's just say zero, zero, one, for instance. So in the end, obviously one byte is eight bits, but to simplify it, let's just keep three bits here. So this is the result, which is in the end one, right? Then we have for writable the same thing, but this time we have one left shifted by one. And this actually results now in 010. And then we also have, for instance, one left shift by two because of IOTA, which results into 100. And this example here is a pretty common use case you will see when defining bit flags, for instance. Right, so let's just quickly print these three constants here. Obviously we want to print the bits, not the integers itself. And here we basically print these three constants. All right, let's just quickly run this program. What we got is 001 and then the expected results, basically. Now I think you can apply this specific concept or keyword to pretty much any sort of problem where kind of a sizing or numbering or automatic numbering is required, right? So for instance, a use case also could be determining the size, right? So we have kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, and so on and so forth. And we can make use of the IOTA keyword to basically define what a gigabyte is in bytes, for instance. All right, let's just quickly get into the next keyword. Now the next keyword is the new keyword in Golang. And this keyword basically allows you to allocate memory without initializing anything. So what I mean by that is pretty much that the memory is initialized with zero. Now obviously this is like less commonly used with normal types like integers, because obviously it's much easier to just use the type directly. So for instance, let's just say that we have a counter, which is a struct. And in this counter struct, we do have a count integer. And then obviously we do have a increment function. Now and then let's just say that we have a function called new counter, right? So we kind of want to simplify the life of the developer by just declaring our struct or returning a newly allocated struct with this new counter function. So let's just say that I want pretty much some kind of pointer to a counter. So a pointer which points to a memory address of this specific struct type. And what we can say here without even initializing a counter, we can just say return new and then counter. Now this looks pretty strange, right? Because we've never initialized count in our counter struct. So let's quickly check out what even happens if we call this new counter function. Now let's just pause for a minute here. And what do you think, what might be the result of this execution of our main function? And obviously, or not too obviously, the result is one. So why is it one? Shouldn't it be throw like an issue or something? Not quite. So first, this kind of new counter function and the usage of the new function here, basically where we pass in the counter struct, just allocates the memory and initializes the memory with zero. So what that basically means is that it declares the counter struct in our memory, but then also initializes the fields in our counter struct to zero. So this obviously works here out of the box. Now what this basically means is that initializes all our fields in our struct with zero or some kind of zero value. So for instance, if we would pass in a string here in our counter struct, it would initialize this string with an empty string. So I think that's pretty convenient for a lot of use cases. And it gives the user or the developer of this function, new counter, basically a clear intent that we return a pointer to a counter struct, which sits in memory somewhere. 
and the values are initialized with some kind of zero value, right? All right, this was pretty cool stuff, but let's look at another and a third concept you might not know in Golang. All right, this is, I think, pretty basic to understand. So let's just say that we do have a for loop, right? Everyone knows a for loop and everyone maybe loves a for loop in Golang. So let's just say that we have a for loop ranging from zero to three, and then we have some performing logic in here. But we now want that whenever the modulo of two of i in this case is one, we want to break out of our for loop. And we can obviously achieve this with break, right? And let's just print i down here. Now let's quickly run this program. And obviously this works, just, just prints zero, which is pretty obvious because it stops at one. And this is how we can just break a normal loop, right? But what if we want to break a outer loop? So let's just say that we have another loop, which is called the outer loop. So we have an outer loop here and an inner loop here, and we want to break the outer loop, right? So we do not want to break this loop but we want to break this loop. So that in the end, this whole construct here is terminated, right? So I'll give you here a more clear example. Okay, and we have this double for loop here, which might seem complex, but it's pretty easy to understand. Basically, whenever we hit the first iteration of the outer loop and the first iteration of the inner loop, we want to break out of this for loop. So let's just execute the program here. And what we got is that it kind of breaks out of the inner loop when i is equal to one and j is equal to one, right? So we kind of skip all the other steps. But let's just say that we want for this specific example, we want to break out of the outer loop, which basically means that we want to kind of terminate the program in this case. Right? So how can we say in this specific if condition that we want to break out of this loop? And it's pretty straightforward. We can somehow label the for loops, right? And with this kind of syntax, which might look really weird to you, we just say that the outer loop is labeled as this here. So basically we can now break and then use outer loop, which is also declared as a label. So this is like kind of a special type in Golang. And what we do now is that we don't break this inner for loop, we directly break the outer loop. Let's just see what happens here. And obviously this works, right? Which is really great. So I think the use case for this kind of labeling and breaking the outer loop is pretty easy to understand. All right, the next example is pretty easy to understand as well, and it is related to loops. So I have adjusted the example a little bit. It is really similar to the previous one. Now this keyword basically allows you to jump to a specific code, right? So not a for loop, not breaking out of a for loop, but jumping to another code part. And it is the go-to keyword in Golang. Now, what I mean by that is pretty much that we can also use the labels not only for for loops. So we can say, for instance, whenever we hit this condition here, we do not want to break, but we want to skip this print statement, right? So if we want to do this, we can just say go to and then next iteration. Now, this is pretty low level stuff here. So let's just demonstrate quickly what this actually does and then I will explain what actually happens here and what the actual use case is. And what we see is basically it skips to rest of inner loop whenever we hit i equals to two and j equals to two. So basically it's pretty similar to the breaking functionality, but in this case it just goes to this label and then executes our code that comes after that code, right? After that label. So what this actually does, it pretty much simulates kind of a breaking functionality, right? So similar to the break functionality in Golang. But all we do here is just jumping to this label, which is called next iteration. And then this code is executed. So basically we are ignoring this print statement. So it's pretty similar to the break statement before, but I think you get the behavior here. 
Now, this go-to keyword can be used to simplify situations a lot. So for instance, if you have some sort of state machine, it can even simplify your logic a little bit. And because this go-to keyword is some low-level programming stuff, right? This go-to keyword can be used for performance critical code. And it might even improve the benchmarks or the performance of your Golang application a little bit. All right, let's just get rid of another low-level construct here. And let's just illustrate the underscore in Golang. Now, this is the last concept I'm going to demonstrate in this video, because I think it's such a powerful concept, but yet really easy to understand concept in Go. So for that, I'm just going to declare a function, which is called some function. And this function just returns an integer slice and a null error. Now let's just make use of this function, right? And what I'm going to show now is some sort of bad practice, right? Because obviously you do not want to ignore errors in Golang. You always want to handle them gracefully. So let's just say that result, right? And then error is equal to some function. Now, obviously, for instance, we want to make use of the result here. So we just print the result. But now we have the problem that error is not used. And what I can say just from looking at the sum function function here is that the error will always be nil, right? Maybe there will be like a future implementation or whatever, but now we can kind of ignore the error just for now. So what we can do here, instead of saying if error is not equal to nil, we can just ignore this error with an underscore, right? And this underscore is specifically marked in Golang as an ignored state. And I think this is pretty neat because what we can do here is ignore values that we do not want to use in our Golang code. Now, this gives us a lot of advantages. So for instance, instead of printing just a slice directly, we can also say for, and then instead of like using the index, because we don't want to use the index in our for range loop here, we just say underscore value and then result, right? This value is now kind of an integer. And obviously <laughs> I forgot the range keyword here. So like I said, this value is now an integer of our slice. So what we got for the value in each iteration of the loop is one, two, and three. And basically with this underscore, we ignore the index, right? Because obviously we can get the index here for our result, but we do not want this. We want to ignore this specific index and we only want to kind of print or do stuff with our value or with the element of our slice. Right, so these are two use cases, how we can use or how we can make use of this really powerful underscore. Now, another really powerful use case is to use that for imports. Now, what we can say here in the beginning, instead of just importing FMT, we can also just import, for instance, database SQL. And like I've kind of mentioned before, you can use the underscore in imports as well. So for instance, obviously we do not use the database SQL module in this case, right? But maybe this kind of module has some setup logic to connect to the database, for instance. So instead of like using it somewhere in our code, we can just use underscore and then import this module. And with that, we kind of ignore the values that this module gives us. So it's kind of the behavior that we want to import modules with side effects. And that was basically it for now, right? I think these concepts should be pretty much straightforward to understand. And I hope you've learned some things throughout this video. Now, if you are, by the way, interested in watching a completely free Golang crash course, which is just 15 minutes long, I highly recommend watching this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye-bye.